here we are once again, driving it home with the professor. I happen to be lucky enough tonight to have my professor on, uh, Professor Philip Miglarese the third uh, from the long line of Miglarese families. I don't know if it's a long line, but it's a it's a it's a big family. Not, oh, nonetheless. Yeah. yeah, long line of fighters. That's right. Yeah. Um, Phil and I have been friends for the length of my jujitsu career, which is kind of, you know, probably over 20 years now. Um, our paths crossed much before that, but I don't even think we realized it, but we can get into, we can get into that later. Yeah. 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 Remember, remember the, uh, the store around the corner from my house. Ah. Anyway, So, um, Phil is a, uh, how many degrees, Phil? Fifth degree black belt. Fifth degree black belt under Helson Gracie, um, owner of Balance Studios. Uh, how many how many affiliates does uh, does Balance Studios have all, all over the world? Um, next week, thirty five. We'll have another one in New York. So thirty five affiliates, probably one of the biggest organizations in the United States, run by Americans minimally. But pro I mean, I don't know of too many other schools that have thirty five uh, schools in their in their association. Um, you know what? What I believe that makes Phil unique uh, as an instructor, but also as a jujitsu practitioner, self-defense expert, uh, yoga master—you know all the things, all the boxes that you could tick off—is uh, Phil's yearning, want, and ability to kind of seek out the best people uh, in any given area to kind of learn from and put himself beside, be it yoga, jujitsu, um, Muay Thai business, uh, all those other things. And I think it's an, it's an interesting conversation to have with him, kind of find out, um, you know, what it takes to be that guy that seeks out this, this knowledge, you know, and some people would say it's hidden. Some, some people say it's not. And I don't think it's really hidden, especially if you kind of ask the right questions. Um, but Phil, when, when you made the decision to move to California to start at the, um, at the Gracie Academy, run by Hori and Gracie, the you know number one son of Elio, a torchbearer. Uh, what, what kind of went into that decision to leave home, to leave South Philadelphia, move to California, basically be by yourself? Like, what, what kind of what was the process like? Uh, the, the whole decision, I mean, it was a huge opportunity. Elio Gracie moved to California. When I first went there, he wasn't there, and I would go back and forth for about like two, three months at a time. When Elio Gracie moved there, I committed as many years as he would be there to to training there. So um, to go back a little bit, when I was in high school, I was in a car accident, and it switched my thinking completely because I was laid up in bed for about a year, and I had to think about what was important in my life. So if I would take the route of college for four years or the – jiu-jitsu yoga journey that I chose and so when I was hurt I said you know we only have one life and let's go after it no one else has done this in America let's go after it and kinda of go to the best so when I was out I was a teenager first time I was out there and um, you know any kid in college can't miss the semester of college so I uh, had to make a big choice to go out there or go to college. So I chose Gracie University. I chose to go out there and learn how to teach and learn how to fight at the same time. Romelio Gracie, Hoist was there. In the very beginning, all the Gracies were there. It was kind of cool. So, I mean, you know, I know the kind of neighborhoods that we come from, and it's not, you know, most kids from South Philly don't decide to move to California one day to learn this esoteric self-defense system. You know, right. how did you... How, how did you explain it to your mom or your dad and say, hey, uh, by the way, I'm going to be moving to L.A. to, you know, to. to well, my mom to... was worried. She's like, where are you going? What are you doing? What is this, all this jujitsu stuff? My dad didn't completely understand it, but he was just behind anything that we did. So, you know, especially when we got into business, um, you know, he had all the help there. But they were both supportive and, you know, they knew I was a different type of kid, too. So you talk about neighborhood and all that sort of stuff, like. My cousin makes fun of me because you go into South Philly, certain parts of Philly, you see kids hanging on corners, and he makes fun of me because I tried it out for like two days, 
hanging out in the corner. I'm like, what are these kids doing? They're not accomplishing anything here. I don't. I want to try something else. So I had two days on the street corner hanging out, and I saw it wasn't going anywhere. So I've been involved in yoga, martial arts since I was a little kid, and I was always interested in both of those things. Like I picked up books on Zen philosophy, on yoga, on martial arts at a very young age, and I always kind of knew I was going in that direction. So, so do my parents. And after, you know, a little bit of a uh, few conversations, it was cool with them that I went out there. You know, first I went to visit because I was young. And then Hoist and Horan and Helson, they always took care of me. And, you know, I stayed in a nice place. We stayed in Hoist's house, which was awesome. And, uh, we all knew each other, like literally Marianne, Hoyce's hus uh, wife rather, she uh, was my brother's babysitter. Okay. So it was all a family thing anyway. She was, you know, in our so, house. So your mom could worry a little bit, but she knew she had somebody she could call she, and say, she hey. She trusted everybody. Yeah, she trusted you. everyone. And I was, you know, I felt like I was a grown up because I, you know, you can attest to this. We we grew up around professionals and adults where I was 15 year old kid talking with a 35 year old man that was successful in his field you know we got a chance to grow up around these people so I think I grew up very quickly especially after a car accident too it makes you think twice about life and you know you hold it very it's very precious and you know starting 17 I wanted to make sure that each step was towards something that I really wanted to do not just a desk job that I get stuck at you know so, so now when this opportunity was kind of afforded to you, you know, where you were like, okay, I can make this decision to go or, or not to go. What were, what were the, some of the things that you weighed? Like, what were you saying? Well, if I go, I can get this. If I don't, if I don't go, these are the, you know, like what are the pros and cons of going as opposed to not going? I, I you know what? I don't even think I had that conversation. I was just like, this is huge. And no one knew what jujitsu was. So I felt like I was, you know, in Philadelphia, who knew jujitsu? 20 people? Like, Guys I mean, that very, very few for sure. Yeah. yeah, nobody knew it. So I felt like I had a, a part of a mission to go out there, gather the information, come back, share it. And that was one reason that helped me afford that too, because I would go out there, I wasn't getting paid for anything. I stayed there three, four months at a time. I wasn't getting paid. I was just in the Gracie Academy from seven, eight in the morning to seven, eight, nine, ten at night. So nobody knew jujitsu. And so I would come back and do these large seminars, make a lot of money, go back, and just keep spending it and going back and forth and just learning. And I figured if I'm going to be doing it for the rest of my life, I, I, I should study the teaching method, which Elio Gracie taught us, how to, how to impart this information in a systematic way. So that's what was fascinating to me. So there was two opportunities. First, you want to go out to the Gracie Academy. We're having this you know, instructor training. Secondly, the the biggest one for me was spending time with Elio Gracie. So just getting it right, getting it, so there was no question of how it was done. You know, this is the way it's done. This is the tradition. And any good evolution of anything, I believe, comes from a strong tradition. So you can tweak it out as long as you know what the primary mission was. So so there was no there was no question in your mind that this is what you had to do. I I had I don't think there were any cons for me. It was just like. Like I said, I had, uh, you know, I saw my life whip before my eyes in this car wreck. This really changed the way I thought about the whole world. And so, like I said, I, I realized at that point I'm young and I can make any choice. And I, and I remember, this is kind of funny, I was 17 when I had this thought. And I thought of myself at 71. I flipped my age around. And I said, looking back at 71 years old, Am I going to, like, regret not doing this? I said, yes, absolutely. You know, so I just I had to do it. I wanted it to be the life that I created for myself, not something I had to do. And that is a luxury to be able to do that and to afford that. So, you know, I took the shot. I, I did it. And, I, you know, I'll never look back. And we worked hard. I mean, it, was, it wasn't just training every day. It was teaching, cleaning, helping people that – couldn't learn jujitsu jiu in a traditional way, like they had different needs. So I had a, a chance to deal with diff different types of students, learning the business, learning how to educate people on a very super introductory 
beginner, intermediate, advanced sort of way. So, you know, it was kind of like an all-in-one experience. Now, did you feel like you got you got a bunch of support from the people back home? You know what I'm saying? Like your home school at the time where you were training and teaching out of, were people supportive of your move to go out there? Yeah, absolutely. No doubt. Because every time I came back, we knew something more, and I wasn't one to keep it. You know, I want to give it away. I want to – because then if you keep it to yourself, you might think keeping it to yourself keeps it inside your head and you have it memorized, and it's not true because there are things that pop up. Um, I just gave a lesson to one of my black belts, Rich Comar, who we both know, and he brought up something I taught him 15 years ago, and I was like, wow, I forgot that move, you know? So if I didn't teach it to him, I wouldn't have received it back 15 years later and just thought about, like, maybe using it in training. So little things like that inspired me. And I was also keeping, you know, when the email um, world started, um, I, I went back and forth with quite a few people, so it was, you know, that was the original social network online, an email, and um, that helped me while I was out there, because it was, like, I was by myself sometimes, and I didn't know anybody, and then over a few months, I met, you know, I had friends from the academy, met, I didn't really know anybody else outside the academy, to be completely honest, I just trained in there all day long, but some really amazing, amazing people, so yeah, I definitely got support, um, from some people just to talk to them on the phone or through an email just to get through it. It's like any other educational hump, you know, you got to go out there, you got to do it, you got to prove yourself, you have to, you know, I was teaching class in front of Elio Gracie. There's no other, there's no person on this earth that scared me more at the time. I would have fought anybody on the world, not, not even having a fear, but teaching Elio Gracie's system in front of Elio Gracie, that was one of the most nerve-wracking, fearful things that I did, so... Well, let me let me ask you about that because you've been I mean, you've been around the world, so to speak. Right. Sure. And you've you've seen a lot of amazing jujitsu, jujitsu practitioners mm -hmm. um, and kind of being having a, a school network, 35 strong. And I mean, I don't even know how many black belts are, do we have, you know, on, and th that have come from you. It's you know, seven. As how many? 67 right so, now. 67. You know. So do you do you think that those principles that Elio taught you? in teaching and conveying the message, do they still hold today as they did 15 years ago when you were in the, at the Gracie Academy? When I teach? What, I, yeah, I, when yeah. you teach, yeah, yeah. Do, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Especially with the self-defense techniques, the standing self-defense system, he had all, like, there's, well, Horian Gracie described it, like every self-defense technique, technique has a bag of tricks to help you teach that to new students. So they all have little tricks to make it easier for you for you to impart that knowledge, and you know the sport, martial art has evolved, and I use the same sort of teaching method for ground techniques, the Birambolo card, whatever, it, it, the same breakdown, the same way to teach it. So he was he was an absolute genius in that respect, um, teaching jujitsu. You know, not only a tough dude, but you know. Um, perfect at demonstrating jujitsu, teaching it, verbalizing the way you're, you're supposed to be doing it in a class, and eth the ethics of it, too. So, you know, teaching in front of Elio Gracie, like, you know, what, what you said you got, you were, you were fearful, the, you know. The, yeah, the I almost one, walked the... out of the room. I was <laughs> like, so the first time I had to do it, actually, I lived with Helson Gracie, so it was in Hawaii. It was the very first time I had to do it. And my deal with Helson, when I went out there, I would teach beginners. I was a, you know, at this time I was a purple belt. So I'd teach the beginners, and my other job was to train in class with all the upper-level guys. That was my job. And, and Helson, man, I'll, I'll never forget this. He's taking care of me from day one. You know, I stayed at his house. I ate his food. I didn't drive his car. He didn't let me drive the car. But everything else, he took care of me to make me better at jiu-jitsu. You know, and like I said, things I don't forget. Not at all. And um, so Elio Gracie was living at the house with him for a little bit, along with Horian Gracie at the time. And then um, I was teaching a private, and then I was supposed to teach beginner class. So I started teaching. It was in the very beginning of class, and Elio Gracie walks in. And seriously, you know that, like, fear that drops down through your throat into your heart, just like, whoa, I'm going to do something wrong. He, uh, yeah, he put the fear in me there, and I looked at him. 
But from my training with Helson, and I trained with Elio Gracie before that, I just said, you know what, I'm going to do as best as I possibly can. There's no, I, you know, you can't demonstrate it nearly as well as Elio Gracie, so I'm not even going to try. I'm just going to be myself, have my class, and I actually I feel like I did fine, although after class he pulled me to the side. I got an hour private from Elio Gracie on the concepts of, of teaching, and plus a nice uh, and I'll never forget this, way to elbow escape from the mount, how to get like a bigger guy off of you. He put, you know, he laid down, put me on top, put his legs a certain way, and it felt so uncomfortable mounting him, and he slipped his leg right out. So I, you know, that was nerve wracking. I dealt with it, you know, I just swallowed and, you know, just kept on going, did it, did it as best as I could, and then, you know, he yelled at me anyway, told me I did it all wrong, and, you know, educated me, which I shut my mouth and I listened to him. And that's, you know, opening up your ears and your mind is huge in fighting, just learning that, you know, getting that information. Now, the, the kind of access that you had, right? Elio, yeah. Horian, Hoyce, Helson, probably Hoyler, Hicks, and like, you know, when, when, the, when yeah, the family sure. was, was really tight-knit. You know, like if you, if you kind of had to give a breakdown of, um, you know, their strengths of saying, uh, you know what, Helson was the man at this, or Hickson was the guy for this, or Hoyler was the was the man for that kind of. If you had to give a breakdown of each one's strength, either as an instructor or as a fighter, what would you, you know, how how would you explain it to people that maybe don't understand, you know, what their strengths are and how good they are in these areas? With the with all the brothers. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can start with Elio Gracie. He was tough. Like he, I, I, you know, from what I hear, he was a tough dad. He made these kids learn so, jiu-jitsu. So wait, b- before you – I, 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 I want to talk about how tough Elio Gracie is because I was here to witness this, how, how uh, tough he was. Huh. Uh, so you want to go back? You want to go back to that? Yeah, well, I mean, because it, it's pretty telling about how tough of a guy Elio Gracie is because we were at the, at the Gracie Academy, one of the – I think I went to go visit you maybe three times when yeah, you were out in yeah, California. We came out. We hung out. We were at the Gracie Academy. We, we I remember the day clearly. Yeah, it, was, it was awesome. It was – we, it was myself. I don't remember if it was Huron or Henner. You you probably yeah. remember better. I'm, I'm I, I don't sure. remember either, yeah. It was either Huron or Henner. I don't think it matters. I think they both would have done what they right. did. I, Elio Gracie and you, right? And um, one of the kids turns to Elio and says, oh, yeah, uh, uh, Grandpa, Phil doesn't think that this technique works. Well, oh, we, really? Yeah, we, that... were pra- we were practicing the hair chop. Com- we told your right, hair back. Right, right. Com- <laughs> comb your hair. Yeah. So then – he says, Phil, come over here in Portuguese. And then, you know, the kid tells you what he said. And you go over there. Wham! He does the hair. <laughs> boom! Just cracks boom. you right in your neck. Yeah, and, like... I mean, you stumbled to the side. And then you just kind of shook your head and said, yeah, yeah, yeah. It works. It works. <laughs> Dude, it works. I think Gracie's hands were the same size as mine. I'm, you know, I'm 6'2", 200-something pounds. You know, his hands were... What, what he... freaked me out about his hands was that they, the, the fingers were so much grabbing the gi... That they yeah, were they kind curved. of going in the wrong direction. Yeah, they curved in the way his hands went in the collar. There, there, uh, some photographer did an outstanding job of capturing his hands. And I, I'd like to find that picture, but yeah, from 90 years of choking people's necks, you know? So right. so there's my story about how tough Helson, uh, <laughs> pardon me, how tough Elio is. And yeah. your, neck, your neck was the sacrificial lamb on that one. But the reason why I bring him up first, because... Every one of those, his kids have the same toughness, you know. They have the same mental toughness. They're not giving up, you know. They're not, you know, they keep on going. So well, Yeah, some some people put some credence in what they call that warrior gene, that you could pass that, like a father can yeah. pass that fighting I, spirit I to a child. I absolutely believe that. I absolutely believe it. All um, right, so Elio, how tough? Let's let's just go in, in order of Horian. Now, if you had to say, man, Horian's the man. At the, like, if you want anything from Horian, what would you want from Horian? Well, what we got is the teaching method. I mean, he was an excellent leader in that respect. Of course, he knows all the self-defense. He knows every move. Great instructor. Um, and I mean, he was the first guy here proving it, doing the Gracie challenges, taking people down and choking them out. So, you know, you don't see enough video of him actually taking those challenges and doing it to legit people. So people downplay his, his toughness. But he's got a lot of finesse on the ground. I've moved around with him on the ground in the past and smooth. And you can see it in here on and Henry too and Halleck. So well, what I you, what sorry to cut you, sorry yeah. to cut you off, but have you seen any of the the, the recent the, all the Hickson interviews that he's been doing? Yeah. So 
you know, coming from Hicks and Gracie, and he's talking about his brothers, and he said, you know, the guy that I, you know, and I'm paraphrasing here, and I think I've talked about the guy that I looked up to as a teacher was, you know, it could have been any of his brothers, but he said yeah. Horian. He clearly yeah. said, you know, like Horian's the man when it comes to teaching people. And, you know, yeah, I, he, was, I, he was bred, I'm assuming, as the leader, you know, firstborn Brazilian son. I mean, and he definitely, you know, we would not know it, any of this stuff, if it wasn't for his pioneering. And so, yeah, I would say the highest is his his ability to here. Here's a here's one his marketing to get people's attention that putting out that hundred thousand uh, dollar reward for beating a Gracie. That's how you get the attention of even yeah, today. Yeah. Our, 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 da our Davey, who was a marketing guy and connected to the UFC, said that he was one of the best brand branding guys he's ever met in his life. He's like, he didn't need yeah, any help I mean, branding. We, I, I take it for granted. That's why that wasn't the first thing that popped into my head. And it's like, that's why, you know? So, I mean, as a businessman, as an educator, but first to clearly get that message out there, like, hey, martial arts world of America, pay attention, you know? Right. And that was the reason why, I mean, you were there. My brother and I took on how many challenge mat Every Saturday we fought some big crazy person that wanted to – Yeah, it was pretty amazing. 100,000. It, it's a much different. It's it's much different today than it was twenty years ago, for sure. No, you can't. No way. I'm like you're like, sir. Can you please sign a waiver? Right, sir. Right, 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 right. No, it's sir. Do you want to go to the UFC or the local? Like you fight mm -hmm. in a cage now. You don't have to do that. And but it, it, that wasn't the point. The whole point was, hey, wake up. Grappling, this jujitsu stuff is real, and he wanted to, you know, like when we did the challenge matches, even at the Gracie Academy, we were instructed not to punch anybody. Rick and I didn't follow through because that's our, you know, we come from two, three gener, you know, three generations of boxing. So if someone's going to throw a jab, I can't, you know. And so, uh, moving, moving on from Horian. So let's move Horian. on to Helson. Yes. Okay? Moving on. So I have, you know, to be clear, I have most of my teaching and uh, training experience is from Helson. You know, his style. Maybe I tweaked out my stuff a little bit, but it's, you know, mostly him. And <clears throat> this Helson's not the Gracie that you hear about all the time. He, you know, he's, you know, like I read the other day, a little thing, the black sheep of the Gracie family. Helson is one of the toughest. And you ask his brothers, you ask anybody in that family, can you control him? Helson is his own person, you know, like he'll tell you straight how it is. It's a little bit different than all his brothers. But, you know, I witnessed firsthand Helson's toughness like tough, he's a little evil on the mat, like first time I ever went to Hawaii, you know, his nickname was Campeon, champion, and people came, went to Hawaii, all the black belts from Brazil to roll with him, you know, and back then, Helson's neck was 18 inches big, you know, he was, he was a young man, and it wasn't a, I, I'm not sure if he was a red black belt yet when I met him, yeah, he must have been, um, and, dude, he went one black belt, tapped him. Second black, they would get in a line, third, fourth, like, no no lie. Six of them in a row tapping him out like crazy. I've seen him roll with his family, and he was a 50-something-year-old man, and, dude, he dominated. And there, the bit that his positions are perfect. Every inch, like, when I, when I, I know the moves when Helson demonstrates, but his the way he can maneuver and manipulate his body, his flexibility and strength, his leverage, he puts his body in the right place every single time. Well, you, you so, remember, and I mean, not to interject myself into yeah, your story, yeah. but when Helson came to Prioli's, you know, God rest his soul, yeah. and he, he's demonstrating the arm lock on me. Yeah. It's, it was the most scared I've ever been having a, a, a technique demonstrated on me because the arm lock came on in at such a position and such an angle that I'd never felt before. That yep. you guys on the side were having to tell him relax, take it easy. Yeah, yeah, you, you, you know, and, and real the real arm bar. You know, that's right. You, you know what yeah. I'm saying? I was like, oh my god, I've never felt anything. Like, I I don't think I've ever felt anything like that since either. You, you know, it was pretty. It was pretty scary, but also impressive at the same time. Yeah, yeah. And, so so his toughness, his technical ability. I mean, he's a like for each degree that we get on our belt, we don't just get it because of time. We, I mean, the last time we did it, Rick and I were in there uh, four hours almost doing everything. And he, I mean, he wasn't nice to us. He's not. He's our friend off the mat. On that mat, he's hollering at us, "Do it right, stand up straight. Your thumb's not like this, you know. Like keep your head up, doing." 
you know, in his eyes, we do it all wrong, but I think we do it okay. Right. So, you know, from a technical aspect and a giving and imparting, he treats us like sons in that way. So, and I know Helson seems to have the, the reputation for the street, the street fighter, at least back in his days in, yeah. in Brazil. And what's even more telling is when, with you know, I'm a big Hickson fan, as you can tell. Yeah. Is anytime there's a Hickson street fight story, he's yeah. always kind of mentioning Helson, telling him keep choking the guy or keep yeah. go, or don't yeah. stop punching him. Do you know what Helsin I'm saying? Like, <laughs> no, it's Team Gracie. They're yeah, not, it's, it's pretty they're awesome. Crazy. Yeah, Especially I mean, if you're not the guy underneath. Uh, you got Hicks and Gracie beating you up, and then you got Helson Gracie screaming at Hickson to continue beating you up. You know, it's got, it's got to be I terrible. I with Helson because, you know, we're from Philly. I grew up, fought in the street a million times. So did my brother. And, and I joked with Helson. I was like, you don't do street fighting. That's beach fighting. <laughs> Does that consider as beach fighting street fighting? I don't know. <laughs> but, but I mean, that's just a joke. It's worse to fight on sand. So. But you know what? You, you bring up a solid point, right? Like, and, and just to, to, to um, digress from what we're talking about here is that street fighting in the United States is a much different animal than street fighting yeah. in, in, in Brazil, right? Yeah. Um, because in Brazil, you'll see the videos where people will make a hoda. They make a big round circle around and they let people fight. Yeah. Here, well, it's our it, primary entertainment still as human beings. It's right. Just like right. People are fighting. It, it, here you don't get away with that, you know. People aren't, you know, unless it's a schoolyard, you know, unless it's high school or grade school. For the most part, it's, you yeah. know. Well, lawyers would be broke if that was the case. So, <laughs> but, you know, law abiding. We have to. Not that it's uncivilized down there. It's not at all. I mean, certain parts of our country. Hey guys, they'll go in the field and go at it. You know, it's just right. like, and then they respect it. The same thing here. Like I would never, I got into a fight, especially a, with a peer, some kid the same age or something like that. No one would say anything. If I got a black eye, nothing happened. I fought, you know, not a big right, deal. Right. These days it's Look, different. I, we could go on for hours. I mean, we could run down the line Hicks in and get the hoist and all this other stuff. And we yeah. know like how amazingly good those guys are. Right. And everyone yeah. has their kind of their, their inherent, their, their inherent strengths. Yeah. Um, now, what do you, th you know, you're coming to, to the Gracie Academy, you're coming to Helsin, you're, you're you know, Horian, Elio, you know, the, the Gracie brothers, and you're coming as a tough guy. You're not coming as a pushover. Yeah. Right? You know, now, what would you say was the main thing from a technical, not, not, not a teaching ability, but just from your, like, jujitsu standpoint that you got from being around those guys? Um, let's think. Well, I, I grew thicker skin <laughs> because everybody played way too much out there, and then they would, you know, you know, push you mentally. So just toughness, like you're on bottom, you're, you know, you feel like quitting. It's like, no, 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 we're not, you know, you're not quitting. And it, a work ethic, too, because everybody worked, and whoever got left behind got left behind. They're out of the program. You know, if you didn't do your job as a, you know, instructor, you got left behind. So they wanted the best people. So only the best people actually got through it. And they had all the toughest guys around then too. Like that was the first time, like, you know, here in Philly we trained, guys knew a lot and they were tough. But the guys in California at that time were tougher because they knew more jujitsu. And I was like, oh, there's a purple belt. I like I never saw a brown belt or a black belt outside of a Gracie. And so, you know, and they all were like, hey, let's beat the crap out of this young South Philly kid, you know. And, um, you know, I had some crazy matches out there. But, you know, work ethic, absolutely. Like Hoist, for example, when he trained for the UFC, he was doing three a days. He was training with a boxer, doing strength training, going jiu-jitsu at night, doing it again the next day. And, of course, with the Gracie diet, everyone – see, that's – they have a head start, the Gracies, because they already have – this is the way you eat, and it works, and it's actually delicious. Why not do it? So they all can recover a lot quicker and train more often. You know, they have more access in that way. So even, even diet, too. I mean, we had access to fruit every single day, fruit and vegetables right at the, right at the juice bar. So that was another thing, just thinking in a healthy sort of way, outside of technique and drilling on the mat, work ethic, and you know, a healthy way of living. And if going back to like my experience with the Gracies, 
uh, taking class from, I had so many classes with uh, Hoist, and Hoist is more similar to my build than all of them. And so I kind of studied Hoist, the way he moved, the way he fought, and then he helped me out a lot too, just like giving me technical advice. He said something so cool to me one time that changed my world because I trained, I would just be defensive and wait for other guys to go. He's like, Phil, go tap these people. Go tap them. Go after them. You have to learn two sides, a balance of training. Like you want, you're a young guy, go after them. And that changed my training. I went, I went after the tap more, you know. So that little piece of information, you know, because he saw me more often trained. Helson, I didn't see that much. Grace Academy, I, I lived there. He saw me roll with everyone. And then uh, going back to, to Hickson and Hoyler, I've had the least time with uh, Hickson. But what I enjoy is something that I can actually get online. I listen to him. You know, he's a very, he's a, he's a deep guy, very connected to like that Zen philosophy, kind of Buddhist philosophy, which I connect with and yoga. So I connect with him on that level. Hoyler was really, really cool to me when I lived in Brazil. Very cool. And he has so many tough guys there. It's ridiculous. And what I learned from Hoyler is transitional speed. He was so good at moving. Like he's not the biggest guy, but he can go with the biggest guy and transition from position to position just perfectly, you know? So... In a nutshell, that's that's what I learned from as many people as you know I've gone with. So, that's me having a great idea. <laughs> there it is, another another million dollar yeah. idea. Two, two, there's two million dollar ideas. <laughs> <laughs> so so now, you you knew what it took for you to make that jump, right? To 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 take the plunge into yeah. the, the Gracie lifestyle, the Gracie yeah. Academy, um, and you've. Man, you're reaping the benefits of it now. 35 affiliates, 67 black belts, right? Yeah. Man, well, I mean, and, you know, a lot of us can thank you, right, and say, you know, I wouldn't have my school if it wasn't for the kind of connection that you and I have and all, all this right. other stuff. But, you know, somebody that doesn't know you or he wants to get connected with you or, you, you know, he wants your advice and saying, Phil, should I make this deep jump into the pool of whatever it happens to be, whatever their passion is, if it's jujitsu, yeah. Muay Thai, pianos, plumbing. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, what, what kind of advice would you give that, that kid, man, you know, if he's 18, 20, 45, you know, like what, what kinds of things would you tell them and what should they consider? Well, this, is, this was my consideration. Like I said, going back, 16, 17-year-old kid, got into a car accident, laid up. And I always say this, like, you know, you're only born twice. Your real life, your real birthday, and then when you actually really wake up. You wake up and recognize that you're in this thing and, you know. And when you have that realization, there's no way, I like, there was no way in my mind I wasn't following the passion. There was going to, there, I would find a way, you know. Like, I lived at the Grace Academy. I slept on a floor. I didn't even have a bed for a year and a half, you know. Like, I just did whatever it took to, to follow that passion. But the thing is, there can't be any BS about it. So... What do you mean jiu-jitsu by BS? Meaning like getting a jiu-jitsu black belt, it's cool. It's, you know, so just to like, you can go buy one, you know, go to Asia World of Martial Arts, buy your black belt. You can do that sort of thing, you know, it looks really, really cool. But to really have that passion to acquire it the right way, you have to have passion because you're not going to get a legit one without putting the correct amount of work, the proper amount of work forward, you know, every instructor requires something different. And that's, you know, that's a whole nother thing to talk about. Right. Yeah. That's another, but without that practice. passion, without that passion. So like I said, the realization that we're here, we're alive and we only have one of these that we're aware of. So and, let me ask you, was, was, was money ever a thing that you were like, Hey man, I'm going to do this cause I'm going to make a ton of money doing this. No, no. I, I never thought that I would be able to afford a house. I never thought any of that stuff, afford anything. So um, I didn't know. I no way I did. I didn't do it for money. Like I, I lived at the Grace Academy. I didn't get paid one dollar, not one. I didn't get one paycheck, not one. You know, I taught private lessons to everyone. I got I taught classes. I literally was the only instructor at the Grace Academy for three straight weeks. I took over the whole Grace Academy. Voice was away. Everybody was away. They're like, Phil, you want to do this? I was like. Sure, nervous, but I think you know. I think I handled it okay because I, you know, I was around the best instructors, and um, money was no. I never see. We didn't grow up like that. Like going back to how we originally met, I worked at my dad's grocery store, right? I never got paid for that. So 
my dad was a big proponent of, you know, like being an intern, an unpaid intern. It's invaluable what you can learn just getting in. You know, I was an intern in a couple different uh, fields and just, you know, I did it in yoga too. I went out to India. You know, I, most people just went to India, practiced with Patabi Joyce, doing Ashtanga yoga, and they just wanted to practice. I wanted to just learn everything he was doing, the way he was walking, the way he was adjusting people, the way he would treat people, you know, digging in. But no one else thought that way there. They were just like trying to get the poses. And I was just trying to get everything I could. And he was cool enough to let me just like, it, I wasn't practicing. I was just sitting and just watching, just hanging out, just having the experience. So I think passion, I mean, those are my two major passions. You know, if you ask me, it's jujitsu. It's yoga and it's technology. I love all of those things. So, um, you know, I push forward every day and actually every one, every one of those aspects and passion is what drives me. So, you know, like it's hard to wake up in the morning doing something you don't like. But if you're passionate about something, don't quit your day job. You know, that a lot of people dive in and it's a, it's a competitive market. I know how the business runs. So do you. And you know, like, would I open another one, another studio? Like, I've been in business for 12 years, teaching for 25 or something like that. And would I do it again the same way? I couldn't. If I did it today, there's way more competition today. When I did it 12 years ago, a lot less. So I would have to do it differently. I would do it smaller. I would do it, you know, I would work at someone else's school, too. Like, I'm not, you know, just because I own my own school doesn't mean that if I ever close it, I wouldn't teach. You know, I would still teach jiu-jitsu. I would do it at someone else's place, you know, as long as it's, you know, that that's my passion. So I wouldn't even do it for money, you know. So, so I mean, the the um, the real takeaway here is, is is you have to do it because you love it, not because you're looking to get a payoff. Yeah, or a black belt because it may be an ego thing too. It's not like money's one thing. You know, the recognition of a black belt is another thing. You know, like I see – People are all so, after that. So let's be clear on. So so I kind of understand what you're saying. Is like so we should like you shouldn't get started because you want a black belt, or that shouldn't be your only driving factor. No, I'm saying um, no. You should want a black belt. You shouldn't. You know, everyone can get one. Everyone can put in that work. But my point is, um, like the ego side of things, like you know, strolling down the street with your black belt on, just like with your shoulders up and being a tough guy, you know, that's not what it was about for me because I knew my, I mean, I struggled for my black belt. I, I, you know, I wanted it from Helsin Gracie, you know, and I trained a bunch of different places. People offered me black belts. I was like, no, you know, this is my instructor. I want it from my instructor and, you know, I want to earn it. So, but I'm saying the, the acquisition sometimes it's like, you know, people do anything they can to earn a black belt, even if it's, you know, Switching teams or going Whatever to school. Whatever it might be, that's their major goal. But as a person opening up a school, you're opening up a business. The primary goal of a business is to build profit. So you feed your children, you pay, you know, you get nice mats, you do, you know, you have to spend that money accordingly. So if you open up a business, you know, like, like we're like the only business that we open up without understanding business. You know, like a dance studio, a martial arts studio, even people don't open up restaurants. They fail to realize they're in business. There's rent to pay, you know? Right. Just because you're good at your skill doesn't make you good at the business side of it. No, I've seen not that at over all. and over again. And some people aren't good at building a business that actually serves people properly. So whatever amount of money you ask for, they should get 10 times the value of that, you know, from your studios and just someone's attitude. The attitude is worth the money sometimes. You know, just going to the right school, right people, smiles and tough training, you know? So, I mean, we've been going for almost 40 minutes now, and, you know, and I, I say this a lot, but we could, you know, dude, we could talk for hours about all these different kind of interesting things that have that have occurred in your life in the sure. past. But well, let's talk about the present. You know, sure. you talked about jujitsu, which obviously you're still passionate about, yoga, which I know you, you're still an avid uh, yoga practitioner, also an instructor. But the last thing that probably a lot of people don't know about is, is technology. You know, yeah. when, you know, what's, and I, I have some insight because I spoke to you the other day about it, but yeah. people that might not know what's when you say technology, you know, it's not like you're out buying a Samsung TV. No, <laughs> I get to see what's going to get made in 2018 these days. That's what's exciting to me. Um, I've had, so I started my whole studio in a digital format. 
I said, forget about paper. I had I think I had the first website, if not the second martial arts website in Philly. And um, I, you know, I made a, that was my way in the business was technology. And I always like, you know, video online and email and that sort of thing. So I use technology to build Balance Studios, which is, you know, jiu-jitsu and yoga business that I have now. But at the same time, always like, as you know, I'm actually speaking to you on a brand new computer, and I always have the latest stuff. I, I really, really like technology in that way, and how it affects us in a social way, online, in a convenience sort of mindset. Like, we have these smart homes now. I think it's absolutely fascinating. But how we can use them to better business, better relationships, better our temperature in our house, I don't know. But um, I started... So from my experience there, I literally, like, I'll wake up in the morning and I study everything technology. Every blog I have automated on my iPad to read. Um, I actually am very lucky to get, like, these private journals from some serious companies that I work with to try to keep up on things that I like. So uh, I've been working recently as a brand and digital advisor, which means, like, I work with companies and I advise them where to spend their money to build their brand story, to, um, you know, uh, where to spend their marketing dollars from, a, you know, it, digitally. I, we've actually been even working in print lately, but, so that that's what I've been interested in, and um, I've also become, this is only about four months now, but a crowdfunding advisor. So uh, another company that I work for. So hold really on, because now I just... I mean, I know what crowdfunding is, but some people yeah. watching it might not know what crowdfunding is. So, oh, I think everybody it. knows because everybody yeah. has one. Someone wants a new BMW, they're like, right. "Hey guys, I hey, need here, it." Here, check oh. out my BMW Kickstarter. I get it. Yeah, check out my Kickstarter. So there's so many, so many. So the company that I work with, they asked me, "Hey Phil, can you look at all the? They want they want the companies, tech companies, all technology. They don't they don't really look at anything else. Um, for example, we have." one that we looked at that is a universal remote that works everything beautifully in your house from your TV to uh, your computers to thermostat to your crock pot if you can believe that you know your slow cooker yeah like everything so and it also recognizes you pick up the remote and it recognizes your hand if your son little kid picks it up it recognizes their their hand and puts up their favorite TV stations it's totally cool and so that was only funded for uh, $50,000. That's all they needed. And now with, you know, all the social networking, got it on different blogs, they raised, it just closed, they raised a million four, and their goals with a million four are way different than just $50,000. Right, right. So I was, at, I was asked to look at companies that are funded, like they were funded 25000 with three days to go. Why? You know, they want to know why. With a little bit more marketing, they can get more people interested, and then these blogs pick them up, and if it's actually a good project, it, it not only does it attract people who want to spend $300 to invest in the product before everyone else, like you get it way before everyone else, They it attracts investors on the other side of it to, to continue. So that's anyway, so... So are are you exclusive to this company that you're advising, or can someone who's well, doing it's a go so new? It's I didn't even know what I didn't right, even. But I'm saying, like, say somebody watches this and they're like, "Hey, I have a hell of an idea. Can I contact Phil and say?" Oh yeah, no, no. I I work for multiple companies. It's just they're looking at specific type of pr products. These these places aren't even companies yet. You know, they just have this cool product, and. Um, you know, maybe no one's seeing it, or maybe their video is lousy, and they have they're they're brilliant people with lousy marketing. Let's say it's that, and you, you don't get much funding if you don't look valuable. You know, that, that it seems to be a way it goes. I mean, coming from like a lighting standpoint or whatever it may be, you know, like maybe you have someone in front of that camera that should never ever be in front of a camera. They should be building the product. You know, right. but they're you know it's a juggle when you're trying to raise money, and um, you know I. I as you know, I, I spoke at quite a few colleges. One of the coolest ones is right here in Philly. I have a relationship at the University of Pennsylvania at Wharton with a lot of different, all the digital marketing and 
um, some of the business professors. So you know, I get a chance to speak in their class. Or what I did one time was it was basically like a TED talk. It was insane about what I do, and it, sometimes it gets complicated, but it, it I kind of pinpoint what I really enjoy doing. It's brand advising, and basically what I do there is. As an advisor, I advise you to get a website that looks like this, that has a button here that tells this story. So that that's my, I don't build the stuff anymore. I can build a website, I can build all that stuff, I can code, but I just, I, there are so many more people in, the, in those areas that are way more brilliant than I would ever be doing it, but I know how to put little things together. So. I know how to bring good people together. We have a nice network of people that do great websites, that build just some really cool stuff. So, um, and it, and being an advisor actually allows me to go through my my day without you know spending five hours on a website. So I'm working with companies that can afford a legal team, a digital team, a copywriter, someone who is just you know, thinking about branding, you know, branding expert on, on staff. So those are the type of companies I've been working with. So it allows me to just kind of, you know, sit in a room with a bunch of creative, smart people and then come up with some way of selling a product. Now, that's and at the great. same that's, time, that, I, That's yeah? entirely, and, and the, the thing that's really fascinating about that is that it's such a departure in from a core business standpoint, you know what I'm saying? Like people would just think that you're just a jiu-jitsu guy, right? Or just yeah, a martial no, arts I mean, guy. See, that's the thing. That's why I call the studio Balanced Studios. I don't believe you're just jiu-jitsu or you're just this or that or just your name. We have people like Josh Vogel there. He's an insane black belt, good at stand-up, but he also loves to do handstands, so he'll lead a handstand class. My brother is an excellent uh, like fitness instructor, like sick. So he teaches jiu-jitsu, but he has this other side of him too. So, you know, you're not just one thing. Um, Jared Wiener, I'm like one of his biggest photography fans. I mean, I never knew he did photography. I follow him on Instagram. It's really, really cool. Yeah, so yeah I, I, went to, I, I went to his, his, uh, his show. It was pretty impressive. Oh, yeah, man. I wish I went. I had no idea before I listened to, um, listened to him on the podcast, so on Lex's podcast. So, yeah, everybody has that other side. Like, you're doing podcasts. Video, video vlogs. Video podcasts, okay. yeah. Video and, tubes. <laughs> and then Marco has a sick guillotine for you guys that don't know, so he'll pop your head off. Mark, Mark, Mark Coatine. Mark Coatine. We'll Mark figure Coatine. out something. The Parazatine. Par Parazatine. I like it. I like it. <laughs> well, look, um, it's like seven degrees outside right now. No, no, we're gonna go for another hour, man. I have no, 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 no bro. My yeah, back can't like I can't do anything too long anymore. I can't stand too long. I can't sit too long. It's, no, that's you know, good. This is great. This is I got all these gray hairs. Um, part one. We'll just label it part one. We'll, part one, and then we'll go to part two. Yeah. And then three. Uh, any any events coming up that you want to let the fine folks at home know about? Anything going well, we on? Have a, we have a really cool event. So my brother Ricardo Miglaris, his fourth degree black belt. He's coming up on his 20th year of jiu-jitsu. We're going to have an event at the school on February 28th. It's all crazy self-defense the whole day long. So we're going to start at like 10 o'clock, end at like 3, then we'll go out to eat at one of you know our restaurants that you know one of our students owns. And uh, we'll just have fun there. And everybody's welcome. That's one thing about balance. Everybody's welcome. I don't care what school you go to. We have no politics in that way. So anybody and everyone can come out and join us. So Rick February 28th uh, yeah. uh, at your studio in Center City. Yeah, from studio, yeah. and the same day we're going to, I can tell you, we're going to launch jujitsuselfdefense.com, and we're really dedicated to preserving what has been done in the, from the Gracies. And when Rick and I have studied a little bit deeper into the transitions, so going from one self-defense technique to another, how they all like link together is pretty cool. Okay. And also how to interlace proper striking you know because I think those are probably the two things that aren't ever really clearly taught is like you're saying moving from it's a, a technique for a technique as opposed yeah. to one technique into the next one into the third one like yeah, a, mean, a regular jiu-jitsu class is taught man we have so many notes and we're going to be shooting an app a website so we're going to you know put our touch on it but what it is like I said it's respecting the tradition that the Gracies laid out the jiu-jitsu practitioners before them 
you know, and the evolution of. So what we'll do is we'll put all those links in the in the description, yeah, so that when yeah, people yeah. watch this, they can go right to jump right to that page and yeah, see no exactly doubt. what you're talking about. Yeah, awesome. All right, Phil. Anything else you'd like to add for the fine folks at home before we wrap it up? That's pretty much it. Thanks for having me. And now, man, thanks. For, this has definitely been my pleasure. So uh, we just drove it home. It's like if you see behind me, it's, it's the windows are starting to freeze. So I want to get home and all this other stuff. But I like, appreciate uh, my professor, Phil Migliori, being on. Thank you so much. Thanks, sir.